Hello, hello. We are back for our last presentation of ID24 2017. We are in our 23rd hour here, 24th. I don't know. I've completely lost track, but this is it. This is the this is the final stretch. <laughs> and uh, we, yeah, we are really excited for this one. Uh, we have Denis Boudreau in the house, principal web accessibility consultant and strategist and trainer for DQ and a member of the World Wide Web Consortium for Education and Outreach Working Groups. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to pass it over to Denis to uh, take it away. And just a reminder that the captions are available on a separate link on the YouTube page below this. And please tweet your questions to ID24, and I'll pass them along to Denis. Thanks, Gene. Thanks. Always, got my, always got my back, Gene. Thank you. <laughs> All right, Denis, take it away. Thanks, everyone. Hi, everyone. Uh, happy to be here. Uh, I thought that I would start this with a little story about uh, the end of the Second World War and uh, how technology uh, made great advancements back then and how it was difficult to maintain uh, and keep up with those technologies. So um, picture this. We're uh, in the, at the end of the 1940s. The war is over. Uh, it's been a couple of years now, and things are picking up. The, uh, the economy is booming and everything. And one of the things that are really picking up are uh, innovations in, uh, in, in, in fighter planes. So the US Army is still investing a lot in, in fighter planes. And uh, the technology is getting really big and really good. And, and the planes are really fast and, and really powerful. And everything is really great. But they have one problem, which is a pretty significant problem. And that problem is that the, the pilots can't keep those planes in the air. They keep crashing the planes every single day. And it's such a problem that at one point on a single day, there were up to 17 pilots that crashed their planes. Now, you can imagine that a plane costs quite a lot. So when you crash 17 in a day, that's a pretty big deal. Not to mention lives that are sometimes lost if the pilots can't get their parachutes off uh, out uh, in time and everything. So there, were, there was this group of, of researchers that uh, were clearly looking into that and trying to figure out what the problem was. And uh, initially what they thought was that the problem was with the pilots. Clearly the pilots were not competent enough and they weren't skilled enough to keep those planes in the air, maybe because the planes were too or too fast or too powerful or, or something. But after some, some testing and some, some analysis, they realized that the pilots had all the skills needed to do this, so the, the pilots were really not to blame. But there was a problem still, the planes kept crashing. So, uh, so they went back to uh, analyzing the plane itself and they realized that there was, there was this one thing that had really never changed in the past 20 years or so. Uh, everything else in the plane had changed except for the cockpits. The cockpits had not changed. So the area in which the pilot was, was controlling the plane, that had not changed in over 20 years. And uh, the last time that they had built a cockpit was for the planes in 1926. And back then, what they had done was they had gathered over 400 pilots and they had measured those pilots on over 400 different measurements. And the idea was to come up with the average measurements for like the, the the measurements for the average pilot and then they built the entire cockpit according to those measurements and and clearly over the years that wasn't working as well as it used to because pilots were, were starting to say well you know what it is a little complicated sometimes or i'm not com feeling completely comfortable with my quote experience pilot uh, piloting that 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 plane because some, some of the controls are hard to reach or, or maybe they're a little too close or, or, or whatnot. So they decided to run another experiment and then this time they had over 4,000 pilots and they measured them again according to hundreds of different measurements. And uh, the goal was to create a new cockpit based on the average measurements of a 19, almost 1950 pilot, thinking that the pilots may have gotten bigger over the past 20 years. So, uh, so they were do, they were doing this, and they were they were starting to 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 design what the new cockpit would be. And then there was this uh, this young researcher that was part of the group uh, uh, that was conducting this study, and he wasn't quite sure that the idea of building a, a a a cockpit for the average pilot was such a great idea because he was thinking that the cockpit itself would never really be able to to adapt to the the actual pilot. So what he did is. And he didn't have the, 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 the bandwidth or the leverage to, to change the thoughts of, of, of his leaders, leadership 
So, uh, so the, the, the analysis came in and the study came in. And at some point, what he decided to do was to look at the, at the measurements of that average pilot and compare that to the actual measurements of all of the different pilots that, that had taken the study. And uh, so, so what he came to realize was that at that point, um, looking at all the measurements, there wasn't a single pilot that fit the average model of, the, of an average pilot. There was always at least something that didn't work. Either a pilot was a little too tall or a little too broad, or maybe his, his arms weren't long enough or a little too long, maybe his shoulders were too wide. There was always something that was a little off compared to the, the average pilot. So he said, maybe, maybe I'm being picky. So I'll, I'll just bring that down to say five measurements. And then again, no one fit in, into that. Um, and, and basically, when he, when he brought it down to the, the, the very basic, which were basically three measurements, even then nobody fit into, uh, n none of the pilots, none of the 4,000 pilots actually fit into the measurements for, for that average pilot again. And that led him to conclude that there really wasn't such a thing as an average pilot. And, uh, and, and in, if we wanted to overcome the problem of planes crashing and, and pilots risking their lives and, and all the economic loss that were related to this, we had to think a different way. And when you think about this, it makes a lot of sense. Imagine if you're, if you're renting a car, for instance, or, or if you're, you're just sharing your car with your spouse, for instance. Chances are, every time you get into that car, if you're not the, the one who drove it last, the last time, you're going to adjust a couple of things. You would never just take the car and leave without maybe adjusting your seat, adjusting your mirrors, adjusting your steering wheel, maybe even just changing the radio station because maybe you don't like that music or whatever. You, you are basically adapting your environment before you can start using it in a way that works well for you. So what that, going back to the 1940s, what that led uh, Gilbert Daniels to, to conclude was that if you design a cockpit to fit the average pilot, then you really design it to fit no one. And that's a problem. And, and he felt really strongly about that. So, so this is a premise to talk about how designing in general for the average user rarely works or, or, or oftentimes leaves people out in the cold. And, and the topic of our, of our, of our talk for, for this hour is going to be design trends and how these design trends are pretty much driving a lot of decisions on the web today and how by blindly, forgive the pun, by blindly just following and, and applying these, these, these design trends over and over again, we're contributing without really realizing it uh, to excluding some users just because they don't happen to fit in the model of an average user. So if you guys want to follow along with the slides, everything is over on uh, at, in Bitly. Um, so if you uh, if you follow that thing, so ID 24-2017-dboudreau, that would be me. Um, then you'll find the, uh, an accessible version of the PDF of the entire thing. So maybe that's easier for you to follow that way. Or if you want to grab that afterwards, that's fine too. Um, so, um, so going back to this idea of design, if I were to ask you what great design means, for instance, in this particular community with, with you guys uh, attending a conference on accessibility, chances are, you would say, well, great design is design that's inclusive, design that uh, is accessible, design that follows guidelines, design that pays attention to color contrast, design that works well with a screen reader or even works well with voice recognition software. That's the kind of thing I would expect to hear from you guys. Um, I could ask by a show of hand who's, going, who's, who's agreeing or not, but obviously I can't see you right now. But, uh, but if I were to ask those questions, this is basically what you would tell me. Now, if I ask the same question to a group of designers who are uh, working really, really hard to get their site uh, shown on awards.com, which is a very popular design site where they, they celebrate great design, their criteria for great design is very different than ours. And, and, and what they would talk about is aesthetics. They would talk about use of color. They would talk, they would talk about subtlety. They would talk about needing to explore, to discover things. They would talk about Easter eggs, probably. They would talk about a bunch of different things that make design really great. But what we consider to be great design would probably just be left out because that's not what their, their focus is. And what that, that 
makes me think is about so so there's there's this um th this doctor here prabhyat uh, singh who's the director of the of systems design the earth institute and um they were working somewhere in africa i think it was uh on, on building bridges to to c connect communities together and what he was saying basically is that they do spend a lot of time designing bridges but they don't nearly spend enough time thinking about the people who are going to cross these bridges and I think in design, we do that too. In, in development, we do that as well. We'll spend a lot of time crafting experiences and, and we're focusing and thriving towards building something specific, but we don't spend a lot of time thinking about the people are, who are going to use those sites and how they're going to use it. And I think that one of the solutions, or, or the, the, not the solutions, but the, 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 the goals uh, in design should be to think about how people are going to cross these bridges or how they're going to use these sites. One of the ways in which we can do that, and something that I like to do a lot, is using personas as design tools. So uh, most, most of the time when, when we run into designers and we're, we're doing training or we're just discussing with them as we're helping them build content so, that, so it's accessible, they're going to acknowledge to using this, uh, personas in, in what, they, what they do. But the personas are always going to be uh, like your typical user who doesn't really have an issue in terms of accessibility. They don't really have a disability. That's not something that they add to, to their experience. But the, the, their personas are going to look like the ones that we have here. Um, you might have an older gentleman. You might have younger women. You might have someone who's in their 40s, might be a professional, or, or might be someone who's going back to school, whatever that is. They're going to fit a certain model. And, and someone like Joe, for instance, would be a perfect example of that. Think about a typical persona. Um, you have someone like Joe, so he's 71. He's a retired professor. He used to uh, teach at Harvard. He's a math professor. Uh, he's widowed. He has children and, and grandchildren. He lives in Boston. His goal has always been or, or, or to write a book, and now he's finally getting to work on that. But he also wants to spend a lot of time with his grandchildren. So typical grandfather living a pretty good life as a retiree um but he has a couple of issues also so he, he really doesn't enjoy like the younger generations because they think they know it all um on the web it's a little difficult because because the fonts are often small and it's a little difficult for, for him to read and even when this, the fonts are a little bigger it's still uncomfortable for him and, and you know it's, it's it's to be expected because he's 71 so his sight has declined over the years and in terms of personality you can see on the right hand, right hand side. So, um, in terms of of, of uh, from the Myers Briggs uh, personality types, so he's more of an introvert than an extrovert. He's more into intuition than, than sensing different different things. Uh, he's more of an analytical, so more into thinking rather than feeling things. He's very much anal analytical in, in what he does and pretty confident in general as well. Um, so in terms of, of, of confidence, he, he's really owning what, what, he, what he knows and, and he, he's not uncomfortable putting it out there and being uh, assertive in that sense. Uh, has pretty good computer skills, is, is pretty resourceful in, in general, knows a lot of things over the years, but his stress level is pretty low. So he's a typical persona that you might want to use, say for building a site for, for retirees. Um, but then he has this little twist. There's particularly to him, he has low vision. So it's not just a matter of, of having his vision having deteriorated over the years. He actually developed macular degeneration. So his um, so, so so the his retina is slowly detaching from from his eyes. So there are always these little things that seem to be floating in his vision. So that affects the way that he that he sees. But also his vision has just declined. So he does need magnification. He needs to bump up the fonts on a regular basis. And then when he does that on most sites, it kind of breaks the design and it makes it difficult for him to, to, to use the sites. Um, and if we were to think about designing a site for someone like Joe, initially, we would probably pay attention to, uh, to, to stuff like not putting too much content at once because we don't want to overwhelm him. Um, we might use a, a somewhat bigger font, but we might not go into as far as thinking that as, as you augment the font size to a certain, like a significant level, like say 400% of its actual uh, default value, 
that it still needs to be readable and usable, um, obviously at some point the design will break and it will need to readapt to or, or reflow to a, a different layout. But usually we don't think about making sure that it does maintain readability and, and legibility, that you don't get any truncated words or that you don't lose information or that some of that information just overlaps and then you can't read anything. Or, or sometimes maybe your, your menu overlaps something else and then you can't click on that link because it happens to be underneath the other layer that just went on top of it. Stuff like that happens to him all the time. And, um, and those are things that we don't really think about much in design. So if we look at some of the challenges that he has, like I was saying, he requires screen magnification because just bumping the font size is not enough. So he actually needs a tool to, uh, to really zoom in and, and just approach the, 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 the pages section by section, so to speak. So he, he can't just look at the entire thing at once. He's not able to perceive anything when he does that. He also has issues when content is a little too far apart. So sometimes he'll have, say, a form, and then the labels are on the left, and the, the form controls are on the right. So you have all your text fields neatly aligned on the right-hand side. Labels are on the left. But because he magnifies so much, he doesn't see both the labels and the form controls at the same time. So by the time he sees the labels and finds the form controls, sometimes he forgets what the labels were. So he has to go back and then go back and forth until he figures it out. and that obviously creates a lot of potential for, for errors and, and, and problems as he's trying to fill in forms. Sometimes he'll fill in that form, but then the, the, the button is at the bottom right corner of the screen, and there's a lot of white space around that button, so he doesn't really have any indication or affordance that the button is there. So he feels like there isn't a button, and he doesn't understand why that is. So he has issues like this that we don't really notice to begin with, because we do see the entire screen at once, and we do make those related those visual relationships that he can't make because he's focused on, or he's magnified to a level where these things are not just visible anymore and then i contrast obviously just being an older an older gentleman uh, his eyes are more tired they, they his set has deteriorated deteriorated over the years so for in order for him to be able to see or perceive the same colors as we do as, as say a 20 year old does that would really not be me these days but say a 20 year old versus him he probably needs anywhere between 10 and 12 times as much light in order to perceive the same color contrast as someone who's much younger would. So colors that we feel are, are pretty significant and, and easy to identify, like some kind of gray on a white background, might look very crisp for us, but for someone like him, they may completely disappear and you may not even notice them. So he, he misses content, content as a result of that. And then you have someone like Kim. So Kim is much younger, 25 year old student, uh, she's involved in a lot of, uh, <clears throat> of, of organizations promoting uh, like, like defense against global warming. She has a kid. She's, she's, uh, she's involved in her school. She, she does a lot of things. She lives in New York. Um, and, and same thing, her, her profile again, someone who's somewhat uh, intro of an introvert, uh, as, as again, a lot of confidence in herself, um, has pretty good computer skills has very little trust. So uh, meaning, for instance, that in, in no, little, very little trust in corporations in general, but also very little trust on the web. She, she's very suspicious of, of people trying to hack her or, or companies trying to sell her things uh, in a way that's not completely uh, expected. So, so she doesn't feel a lot of trust in general uh, uh, about the outside world. And, and again, if you were to design for someone like her, you would probably just design a site for a younger person and you would think about what is really trendy and you would want to take advantage of those things because she's young, therefore she probably likes stuff like Facebook and Instagram and stuff like that. But in her case, again, there's a little twist. She has vestibular disorder. So if you do build a site that's really trendy and, and up to date using the, the latest trends, you might want to consider using a single page application for your site. So you'll have this site that has all of the, this motion and, the, and these movements, and then you're clicking on something and then it swooshes back to that section of the page, and, and it does all these great things that we see on about 99% of the sites these days. Um, but for someone like her, it creates a big problem because like a year or so ago, uh, she had a stroke, so something happened and she had a stroke, and then from that point on, she, she did recover, but she has constant vertigo now. So she constantly has, feels like she has a bit of a headache. She feels dizzy. Uh, when there's too much movement around her, she feels sick. Sometimes she has to just, uh, she just needs bed rest because that's the, the only way that she can 
recover from feeling dizzy. Uh, so she gets on sites like these, and then very quickly, she feels like she could even throw up. So it's, it's like motion sickness in a way, uh, but while being at home or on her, her mobile device and, and not expecting to be triggered by something that moves too much. So again, challenges in her case would be stuff like motion sickness, so getting dizzy or even nauseous when there's too much movement. Uh, because she has migraines, she is not always completely engaged in the content. And that's something that we forget also. So we might think about motion sickness as being a thing, but if you're feeling dizzy and you have migraine or headaches, um, your level of, of, of engagement and, and, and concentration is affected by that. So things that would otherwise be pretty obvious, you may completely miss as a result of that because you're no longer in your, in your hay game. So, uh, so that makes it difficult for you. And then because she feels that way, then she's likely to miss information. So, so if we were to do user testing with her on, on certain tasks or flows, she might be someone who would surprise us missing that obvious button or missing that obvious notification just because she's not in her in her in her in the best in her best the best condition at the moment, and and that affects again how she uses the web. And while she could be a pretty typical persona, that disability or that issue that she has makes her completely different than uh, than another uh, user that would be uh, that would have the same demographics as she does. And then finally, we have someone like Amanda. Again, younger woman in her late 20s, uh, she's a nurse practitioner. She wants to be a doctor, so she's still this, uh, uh, studying to do that. She doesn't attend as, as much yoga classes as she'd like, but she's dedicated to that. Uh, she's someone who's quite impatient. She's always moving, and she's always, she always has a million things that she wants to do. Um, her attention is, is a little affected by that, and she can't stay focused for long because she happens to have ADD. So again, something pretty common in a lot of people. Um, but if we were to build an interface or, or, or an experience for someone like Amanda without the ADD, we would build something for someone who's young, energetic, uh, active, uh, focused, dedicated, who wants to study, who wants to further herself. But if we factor in the fact that she has ADD, I think it changes a lot of things in, in, in our design. I think it should affect a lot of things in our design. If we have an interface where there's a lot of movement, if we have an interface where there's a lot of subtleties or if we have a lot of density and, and we have all these different things that call for our attention at the same time, chances are she's going to miss on some of those things. And maybe she'll miss on the most important ones. And if it's too complicated or if it just goes too fast, she has a tendency to abandon easily because she feels overwhelmed by that stuff. So some of the issues that she has, uh, short attention span. So if we don't focus the the the, the the, the flow in a way that, that makes it really obvious, very quickly something else will grab her attention and she might just go completely off course and, and down rabbit holes um, at the least expected moment. And that would not be surprising. Um, she's easily, easily misled because she makes a lot of assumptions. Because she's someone who's, who's kind of impatient and, and she has a hard time focusing, she doesn't read everything. She reads really quickly, makes her own mind, and then makes decisions off of that. So if our content, for instance, is a little too wordy, there's too much information there, chances are she's not going to read it all and she's going to make assumptions based off of what she thinks the content is about. And then she might be misled. And that happens to her quite often, as a matter of fact. And when she realizes that she's gone in a, a, a bad direction or she, she's been misled, then easily she can feel like she's, she's just not able to do it and it's complicated and she doesn't feel like doing it and then she abandons and she quits. And, and we, if we didn't know that she had ADD, we would just think, that's kind of weird. She doesn't really fit into our persona because they're, they're supposed to be focused and everything. But then her ADD makes all the difference in this particular case. So this idea of designing for the average user, basically what that means is that we run the risk of leaving a lot of people behind, whether we realize it or not. So you have the average users in the middle of your bell curve, and then uh, around the edges of that bell curve, you have people that use smartphones or people that use tablet devices. And, and, and <clears throat> arguably, this is something that we've integrated over the past couple of years, where when we design, we design with both mobile and desktop in mind. Oftentimes, we design with mobile in mind, and then we make it to make sure that it also works well on desktop. <clears throat> but the, the lines are getting quite blurry there. But at the extremes of the, that bell curve, people that are just older or people that, that have disabilities 
we don't account for them much. But if we did do that, if we paid attention to, say, Amanda with her ADD, and we were, we were to factor that in when we design, we would still be able to cover and, and cater to the needs of people that are using mobile devices or our average users, but we would also be paying attention to people with disabilities by, by, by doing that. If we were to think about people that have macular degeneration or that are just getting older and maybe have arthritis, for instance, and can't use a mouse for very like subtle, um, subtle uh, like like fine motor skills, then again we would be designing for people that are getting older, and as a result of that, our interfaces would be easier to use on a keyboard, and everyone would benefit from that, whether they're on a mobile device or they're using a uh, they're they're part of our average users, so to speak. So this idea of designing for much larger than the average user is, I think, the best way to ensure inclus inclusion and inclusivity in, in, in our design. <clears throat> so there are dozens of, of, of trends right now that are, that are raging. Uh, those are some of them. So we have interstitials. Uh, so so you're, 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 you're triggering something on your site, and then there's this loading that appears, and then there's a couple of seconds sometimes. And some users actually develop something called interstitial anxiety as a result of that, because they don't really know what's going on, and they're kind of concerned because some maybe they're missing something, or maybe they're if they're using a screen reader, for instance, they might think that they just don't know what's going on. So maybe maybe the site just dropped on them or something, so they don't really know until it finally picks back up, and then they're like, "There's a relief. It, it, it did work." But it's actually a thing, uh, interstitial anxiety, and that's a result of using interstitials that much. Cinemagraphs is another example of that. Uh, there are countless sites out there these days that show you information that's supposed to be significant, but then you have this video playing in the background, and that video just grabs your attention and sometimes prevents you from reading the content because there's so much happening that you can't focus on the content itself. Um, ghost buttons are another thing where you have these buttons that are made to be very subtle, sometimes to the point where you don't see them, uh, which kind of begs or, 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 or begs a question, really, if you're going to have like uh, call to actions that are meant to allow people to buy your products, why would you create use ghost buttons for, for those, the, those controls or those call to actions that people might miss because they're not obvious enough? You have micro interactions where you're, you, you're, you're like, like Facebook is a great example of that. I'm not saying that Facebook, Facebook does it wrong. I uh, actually haven't checked that, but the, the idea of, of being able to like, to love, to, to find something funny or whatever, all these different options that you have, those are, those are micro interactions. We see those more and more in, in most applications. Slack has a lot of those things as well. And again, if you're, if you're interacting with these things and you don't have any, any direct return on what you're doing as someone who uses a screen reader, you have no idea what's going on. So you're left again with this feeling of not really knowing what's happening. Dramatic typography is another example of that where we can use pretty much all the fonts we want these days on the web. And as a result of that, people are using them quite a bit, sometimes too much. And some of those, these fonts are very hard to read. They're hard to read for most of us, but they're increasingly hard to read for someone who has, say, dyslexia. Um, and then it just makes it more difficult to go through content. So those are just five examples of this. We have more. We have parallax scrolling, uh, where, again, someone who has a uh, vestibular disorder might just feel a little dizzy or uncomfortable when, uh, when there's a lot of movement going on. You have endless scrolling, where you might have someone who has to scroll like forever to get to the bottom of a page. Uh, and then you have someone who might not be able to use a mouse who has to tap through everything to get to that, the bottom of that page. And sometimes we see very surprising things, like Skittles for, for, for .com, for instance, where at the very bottom of that endless scrolling, there's actually a footer with significant information. And you can just never get to it. Um, so someone somewhere it's kind of missed the, the idea of, of, of that. Uh, because you can, you can get to it if you're, if, you're, uh, if you're fast enough and you're using a, a mouse. You can go down and, and then click on it before it loads more content. But if you're using a keyboard, there's just no way to do that. Material design is branded by Google as something that is really accessible, yet they change the way that the, the forms are presented. And now the forms are just like an underline with a label on top of it. And if you can't recognize those as the form controls, you're kind of screwed. You don't really know that they're forms. And, and user testing shows that people don't, I mean, I mean, have an issue with that. And that's something that 
in material design probably needs to be addressed for accessibility. Placeholder labels, another great example. We had uh, Rust Weekly earlier, earlier today, or was it yesterday? Can't remember now. But um, <clears throat> previously, that, that talked about uh, talked about placeholder labels and how to build them using CSS so they're accessible. Um, that's great. But most placeholder labels also cause cause problem in terms of of, uh, of color contrast issues, uh, in terms of of, um, of persistence when they're no longer there and stuff like that. And then you have chatbots, for instance, which is another thing that's people are going crazy over chatbots these days and very conversational interfaces. But again, if they're not built to work with screen readers. That's a bit of a problem. And, and you, you look at a chatbot like the one from CNN, for instance, and I, I basically dare you to use that with a screen reader and, and, and find news. You won't find any. You will be able to, what, to, to, to navigate around all the interface for all the, the directions to get the news, but you will never actually find one because these parts are just not made to work with a screen reader. So what I thought I would do is look into two specific examples of this. So the parallax scrolling and the placeholder labels. And quickly go over how these affect users based on the personas that, we, that we've seen so far. So parallax scrolling being the first one. Because the site, so the boat, uh, that's an sbc.com uh, site. Um, just using, just going to that site is a bit of a challenge because it, it, there's so much resources that are, that are invested there. But, so that I thought I would just show you a quick example um, with this video here of what it does. And then as you watch it, if you can see it, and I'll describe for those of you who can't see it, but as you go through this, um, just pay attention to what that experience might be if you're someone who has vestibular, a vestibular disorder. So the idea of this is um, you're, you're on this site, and it, it, it tells a story of a uh, Vietnamese people that in, the, in 1975 wanted to flee Saigon and, and, and just get away from the war and, and, and take a boat to Australia. And, and obviously, that's a pretty long journey. And, and they were leaving on very small boats. And the boats really weren't made to, uh, to, uh, for, for that kind of, of travel. And so, the, so the, every now and then, the boats would get into a big storm. And then it would, it would rubble quite a bit as a, as a result of that. Um, and, and so, so this, for those who can't see the site, the, the, basically the experience here is that you have this short story that goes through uh, as you're scrolling down the page, but you have these movements as if you were on a boat and, and, and the entire screen is moving as if you were in a storm yourself. And, and not even having a vestibular disorder, I'm looking at this and I'm like, wow, they're really pushing it. So someone like uh, Kim, for instance, who has constant vertigo, she goes there and she's automatically triggered. Uh, to, 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 feel, to feel sick or feel dizzy or, or even nauseous in that case. And then on top of that, they're dep depicting this, this, this situation where they're in a really big storm. So you have all these different changes and flashing that's, that are happening when the lightning strikes, and then you go from black to dark backgrounds. All of these things are there to recreate this idea that they're really in trouble on that boat. And we actually feel it because they made a re they did a really good job at, at recreating the, this experience, but um, but they can definitely trigger some problems for some users by doing so. So, as I said, we do a lot of usability testing, and uh, and we test for different things. We didn't test that particular site, but we tested um, uh, with, with, with movements on, on on some of the sites that we've tested for, and some of our users, uh, one of our users said something like this at some point. So when developers go crazy and implement infant scrolling effects, it sometimes makes me feel as if I could get sick. It greatly undermines my ability to get things done. So again, if I were to see you, I would ask you to try and figure out which one it is. But I'm guessing you guys, with what I've said, are already thinking that Kim is likely the person who said that. And that would be, that would be accurate. As someone who has vertigo, she's clearly someone who could get sick looking at something like this. But Joe is also a pretty good candidate for that. Because just because he's older, he's not really cool with, with stuff like that and stuff that moves a lot and, and when he's not expecting it. So that could make him feel uneasy as well. And then Amanda, in that case, doesn't really uh, care because for some people, that's not a problem at all. Um, she, she represents that. But for other people, it doesn't mean you don't have to have a vestibular disorder to be, uh, to be uneasy with something that goes as far as, as that kind of parallax effect. 
So some of the issues, some issues that, that Kim was reporting as a result of that were this feeling of motion sickness, feeling like she could, she could throw up if that was moving too fast, uh, that she had no way to control the movement. She's like, so these effects are kind of decorative. They're, they're like just for the effect of it. They're distracting. Why can't I just click a button to stop them or a link to stop these things and I'd just have like the static version instead? And that would that would work for me. I mean, the idea is not to prevent everyone from using these things, but instead to provide a mechanism so some of those some someone who can't appreciate it or won't appreciate it could just turn that off and still appreciate the actual story, for instance, of the boat, which is a pretty good story if you can get around all the craziness that that, that goes with it. And then this idea that there's no warning. So she gets there, she's not expecting it, and then it triggers almost automatically. And then she's 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 stuck with this. And and what would it how complicated would it be to just provide some kind of a warning beforehand so she would know and then would decide not to go there because she doesn't feel like getting uh, having a a like like a a like feeling sick as a result of this. So again, very little things uh, that that that, well, not very little things, things that do impact her, but for which we could easily find solutions. If we were to think about someone who has vestibular disorders when we're building that, like complex parallax effects. And that reminds me of the story. So I have a, actually I have three kids, but my oldest son is 15. <clears throat> and two years ago, we went, to, uh, we went to an amusement park in Montreal. It's called La Ronde, and it has this really, really big roller coaster apparently one of the biggest in the world. And there's this huge drop at the beginning. And, and you're, you're going up, um, like this first, this first uh, I don't know what you call that, but this, this first, at the top of this first drop, and it's probably like four or 500 feet high. It's really, really high. And then from the bottom, from the ground, when you look at it, it looks pretty steep. But when you're at the top of it and you're looking down, it actually looks like it's 90 degrees down. It's, it's crazy steep. And, um, and I, I really want to go. I haven't been in, in roller coasters for like 20 years by, by then. And my kids are finally old enough to go. So I'm really pushing him to go. As, as a the bad parent that I am, I really want him to go. And he's not, he doesn't want to. He's scared. And I'm pushing him. I'm bribing him, trying to find any possible way for him to, to agree to come with me. And then he finally does. He finally gives in. And we go there. And, and I'm really excited. And he's, he's pissing his pants, basically. He's really, really not comfortable with the idea. But he wants to look tough, so he comes to, and, and again, being the bad parent that I am, I just completely push him, and I don't care about his feelings at all. I just want to go. And uh, so we get there, and we're, we're climbing up that, that, first, uh, that, that first, I don't know, I don't know what the word is in English. We're, we're climbing up that first one, and we're ready to get down in, in that first drop. And then as we're going up, he starts to get a little excited. And, and as I'm going up, I'm starting to feel a little uneasy about this because it's actually pretty high. And I'm like, wait a minute, what if something happens? And now that the parent in me kicks in finally and realizes that I may have endangered my son and that's not cool. So, um, so we, we, we finally get to the top and, and we go down the first drop and, and we're going through the entire thing. And my son is enjoying it like crazy and he's going, completely bananas about it and he wants he really likes it and he wants to go back he's like we're doing it again this is great and then i'm, I'm not saying anything because i am freaking out and, and and don't get me wrong i used to do that all the time when i was 15 and 16 and 17 and in my young uh, my early 20s i would go there all the time and i liked it a lot but now for some reason i really don't like it that much and i realized that when we used to go to the park with my kids when they were younger and just using the swings Sometimes I would feel like it's moving a little too fast for me. I was like, what is this? And I realized that maybe because I'm older, I don't, I don't find it as cool as I used to. And that's actually a, a fact. So, so when, we're, when we came out of there, I was basically holding the, the rail as we were walking down and my kid wants to go again. And I'm like, ah, you can go, son, no problem. I'll just wait for you here. Um, and I'm trying to figure out ex excuses for not to go again because if I, if I went back, I probably would have puked because that was just too much for me. And that's actually a thing. When you, when you look at, at parallax scrolling or just, just vestibular disorders in general, it turns out that about 35% of the adults over the age of 40 develop some kind of vestibular dysfunction at some point. And I'm probably one of those people. So it really didn't used to affect me before when I was younger, but now clearly I can't do these things anymore. And, and 
that's just a thing. So, so when you know that about a third of the population over the age of 40 is likely to feel uneasy with something like that, then I, I think you think twice about using very intense scro scrolling or movements effects in, in your sites because chances are you're going to accommodate some people as a result of that. So limiting the amount of animation and movement in the pages or the views is probably a good idea. Like less is often more in that case. Providing meaningful uh, context so, so users are, 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 are with, this, with disorders are, are warned beforehand. So again, just letting them know this might, this might be a little rock and roll or something. So you, you might want to consider before, before you go there. And then again, finally, just providing a way to disable that effect. So you can switch, you can quickly switch to a static version and then don't have to suffer to that stuff. And, and if you were to do these things, then I think that parallax effect would be okay. There wouldn't be a problem um, because we could control it. So again, the idea, and, and, and hopefully that's how we're looking at accessibility these days. It's not so much a question of saying you cannot do this, but rather a question of saying, if you want to do that thing, you should be aware of these things and then build according to a couple of, of, of considerations so no one will be affected negatively, negatively by, by what you're, you're trying to do. And when we do that, we're actually being much more open. And I think that designers, for instance, would be much more receptive to our message because they would feel like there's, a, they, there's room for negotiation here and they can still be creative and do what they need to do or want to do. And then we're there to support them as opposed to being there to just prevent them from doing what they want to do. And placeholder labels are, are kind of the same thing. So you've seen, you've seen hundreds of them by now, I guess, forms with no visible, well, I mean, no, 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 no permanent labels. The labels are part of the, the form controls. You click on them, they disappear, you type in information, and then you no longer have the labels, and you can't really tell what they were. And if you forget, that's kind of a big deal. So, so again, if you're, if you're just logging into a site, that's easy. You're going to uh, you're you're going to uh, to remember that you had a username and a password. That's kind of easy to remember. But if you're going on a form that has five, six, ten different uh, different form controls, it might be a bigger problem because then you might fill in all those 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 controls and then forget the fourth one. Was it really my credit card number or was that my phone number? I can't really tell right now. So your only option is to go back to that, that form field, remove the, 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 your, your, your data, confirm what it was, and then put it back in, which is a huge pain in the, in, in the, in the neck to, to do, because then you have to double check everything. And, and that's just us if we don't have any particular issues from the, on a cognitive perspective, a cognitive level. Take someone like Amanda, who has ADD and goes quickly through things and forgets things, she's very likely to struggle with something like this. So it, it does create issues in, in different ways. So again, uh, out of the, the testing that we've done, someone said at some point, forms no longer have persistent labels. They disappear when we fill them in. And that really sucks because it creates a lot of uncertainty. And I can't remember when I can remember what the labels were. And of, of course, that's Amanda here. In this case, as someone who has ADD. But again, Joe is likely to, to suffer from that. Uh, as someone who's older, someone who's, I, I mean, all your senses deteriorate over time and, and your, your short-term memory might be affected. Maybe he's more tired that day. Maybe he has a lot on his mind and he just doesn't pay attention much. And now he's feeling, going through that form and he just can't remember what those things were. And having to go back and, and remove the label, the, the, the content to check the label then put it back in that affects his stress level again. And if you remember, Joe has a very low trust level to begin with. So if you're trying to build a relationship with your potential clients and you're trying to look good for them and you're putting him through an experience like this, it's only going to decrease his stress level towards you and you're really not doing it right then uh, as a result of that. <clears throat> so issues that Amanda runs into as someone who has ADD, poor contrast. So she looks over things really quickly. She might not even notice that there's a label there. So just say she using, she's using her phone to fill in a form and she's outside and it's really sunny outside, those labels might completely disappear when, when she's not really paying attention much, so she might miss them altogether. Um, she, uh, we, we had a situation, uh, actually, where we said, well, well, you know what, if there's a contrast color issue with the, with the placeholder uh, text, let's just darken that text and, and use a darker color so people won't have a color contrast issue with it. So we tested that stuff. 
And then someone like her would come in and would assume that the information that was there was, was actually data that was pre-filled. So she would not even look at it because there was something, already something in there. And she would not realize that those were actual labels. And she would just try to submit and there would be errors as, as a result of that. Um, so that was another significant problem that we were running into that we didn't really expect to begin with. And then this idea that they're not they're persistent. So you have to double check by removing the information before you can submit, which just adds a, a huge load uh, on, your, on your users as a result of that. So all of that stuff might get you to think about why are we doing this? And, and again, another, another little story. This is Times Square. Um, always wanted to go there. Finally went in December of last year. And, and I had this idea in my head of how Times Square looked based on TV and movies and stuff. But I had no idea how big it was until I actually got there. And, and I kid you not, I, I spent probably 30 minutes on a corner of the of, of, of Times Square there, there just by the by, right, right that at the McDonald's, if you if you know where, where that is, just looking and trying to sync everything in. And I just could not process because there was too much stuff. And I don't really, well, I don't think that I have too much ADD. Um, probably have a little, but um, but I was just trying to figure out what I was going to have for dinner that night. And I had about 50 options in front of me, and each one looked cool, and I couldn't decide. I was overwhelmed by that. I was overwhelmed by all the different lights and all the different advertisements that were there. And I felt exactly like Amanda feels on a site that's really crowded. There's just too much going on. I can't make a decision. I don't know what to do. And I spent 30 minutes easily just trying to, to process all that information. And I felt really like unable to, to make a decision or make a choice because there was just too much. And I, I do feel that's the way that, that, that people with ADD feel on, on some of our sites when we don't pay attention to that cognitive overload that we're, that we're creating as a result of having too much information. So a little bit of data again from a completely unscientific uh, research that I, that I ran, we, meaning that I asked about five or six friends what they thought about it. And basically, everyone agreed that they just ate it when you have to uh, remove your data from your, from your form controls to double check what the values were before. It sucks. Everybody agrees to that. But yeah, we're still doing it. So a couple of things we could do to try and make that better would be to begin by programmatically associating the text labels with each field. So even though we're not really seeing the labels, doesn't mean that they can't be there in the first place. So again, going back to Russ's uh, session earlier this year in ID24, that was the idea. You start with a programmatically um, associated label with every form control. You hide it off screen if you don't want to see it, but at least it's there. So screen reader users at least are covered. They're going to get to it and they're going to hear something because one of the issues with placeholder text as well is that it doesn't really convey to screen readers reliably. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't uh, based on the, the tool you're using. So you can't really rely on that to provide something that's, that's reliable. Uh, hey, so yeah, Denise. Sorry, this is Johnny James jumping in here. Yeah. Uh, we we only have a couple minutes left here, and I really hate to cut you off, but we have a, mm. a question, a couple questions, and we would love it if you uh, would field those because we're we're just coming to the uh, up to the end of the hour here. So, yeah. Okay, sure. I, I still sorry, have like, I, like two or three slides. I could maybe go to it afterwards. That's fine. Let's go to the questions. All right. So uh, we have one here from Matt Ader. Yeah. Sure. Sure. So you know, one of the things that that I heard a lot today throughout presentations about the different kind of uh, personas and stuff. And when we talk about them, I also heard a lot from different people about how to use Zoom inside of applications and websites to actually kind of adapt the view for developers to see what they're seeing, what a low vision person would see. Is there a major difference if they're using like Zoom built into a browser versus Zoom using a um, assistive technology and how that may interact with that website? I think there's a huge difference. Um, like if you're using just your, your browser controls, like Control Plus or Control Minus, um, on some sites, what, I mean, uh, by default on, uh, on every site these days, it's just going to expand, like it's going to zoom in. So it's going to expand everything proportionally. So nothing ever really breaks. And what you create is a uh, horizontal scroll bar. So you're pan you end up panning left and right. That's your worst case scenario. But you don't lose, you don't have any information that gets truncated or, or that overlaps. They just, they, they just go to a wider screen. If you happen to have a site that's responsive, then it's going to reflow 
and chances are it's going to work pretty well for you. Um, but if you if you disable or if you change the the way that your zooming works in your browser because you just want to focus on the text and you and you end up text resizing as opposed to page zooming, then your content of the text will uh, will 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 get bigger. And then it will do that according to, again, the containers that you have. So that's when you get content that gets truncated because it just doesn't fit in the containers anymore. Or when the containers just can't align horizontally, they end up um, stacking vertically instead. And then sometimes they just overlap on top of one another, and you start losing information that way. So that's what happens when you use your browser. If you're using an actual assistive technology, like, say, um, uh, Zoom text, for instance, or, or anything like that, what you're basically doing is you're focusing only on a, on a part of the screen at once, and you're only seeing that part of the screen, but magnified. So you may end up, like for instance, if you're if you're going to uh, to three x or or six x, for instance, like six times more, um, what you'll end up doing is breaking down your your interface in six columns and six rows, and you're going through each one of those cells, so to speak, one by one. So they're they're magnified to the entire the entirety of your screen. So you're looking at only that part at once. And you can probably read that stuff now, but you lost all, um, all relationship with the, the, global, the globality of your page. So you can no longer see the entire thing. And that makes it difficult for you to figure out where you're going. So you constantly have to move between being focused in or zoomed in and then zooming out to see the entirety of, of the page just to at least get an idea of how it works. So it's a very different experience. Um, but if you do design for both, then you can you can prevent some of the issues. And the biggest issue that you'll you'll prevent if you do that is is issues related to proximity, for instance. The other big problem that you get when you're uh, when you when you just use page zoom uh, is that by creating that horizontal scroll bar, you basically break the ability to read content efficiently because now your paragraph might be over the equivalent of two uh, two browser width. So you have to constantly scroll left and right, and then you can, while you're scrolling back and forth, you're not focusing on the content, and you're not paying attention to the content, therefore you're not as engaged in it as you would be otherwise. And that also creates so would, other issues. You have some, some cognitive disabilities. So would you consider using a you know, built-in zoom of the browser is, a, is enough, or does somebody need to be testing with that magnifier as well to get a true perspective of the user's experience? I think testing is always required. Should always be there. Um, I mean, I mean, even if you if you build controls to to, I mean, you could you could build in features that allow you to to bump up the font size or or or, or downsize it, but um, but that's only going to work for some people. And again, that's the idea of saying so. We'll have different sizes for different people based on average users, people that see well, people that don't see well, but. We, 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 most of us know, know some people in our, in our field that are, are low vision users and that require much more than just a, 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 a resizing widget that allows to double the, the font size, for instance. We need much more than that. And those tools will never be able to account for their needs. So trying to build a tool that's made to work for everyone, that doesn't really work ever. But if instead you build, you build your content in a way where it adapts to whatever settings I want to use because you build your CSS properly, then everyone is 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 accounted for, and you don't need to build in those little features that somewhat work sometimes. So uh, we're running over time now. Um, Matt, was there any final remarks that you wanted to make? No, I mean, it, before we I think wrap it's up been ID twenty four for twenty seventeen. This has been this has been a great um, ID twenty four. It's it's my first, and um, I think the the folks of TPG putting forth, I mean, some of these folks have stayed up 24 hours. I don't know how many of them did it, but a few people did, and or at least it feels like it. And it's been great. I, I love it. So I really can appreciate I, the effort that. Can I, can I just yeah. leave with one, let one parting thought? Yep. Um, yes. Yeah. So one of the things that, uh, that had the most impact on me uh, as, as someone who does just the testing and profoundly affected me, hopefully in a positive way, um, was working with a, um, a young blind um, developer. And, uh, and when we do usually testing like that and, and, and we're going through features with them, we did a lot of that for air carriers in, the, in recent years because of ACAA. So we're doing that with them. 
And, uh, and at the end of the session, I, I always like to, tell, to ask them, so if you had one thing you could tell to developers and designers, what would it be? Kind of like the question we had for Burke earlier, if you, had, if you could remove one, one, one ARI attribute, what would it be? And, and what he said was this. He said, I look forward to the day when web professionals finally understand the, the power they have over my ability to succeed. So we had been, we had going, we had been going through all these different flows, trying to book a flight, trying to cancel a reservation, do stuff like that, and he couldn't do it. And it really wasn't because he didn't understand the web. He actually builds the web on a regular basis, but he wasn't able to work and, and, and go through the tasks before the way it was built prevented him from being able to do that. So that, that's, that really stuck with me, and, and I, I keep bringing that, that slide up in, in most presentations these days because I think it's pretty powerful we have the power to make it more accessible to people. And by not knowing or realizing that power, we often create barriers for them. So uh, I think that's a- uh, Excellent, ex excellent final comment. I definitely believe in that. Absolutely. So thanks, thanks again for so everything. Merci and we'll, yeah, and, and I think that we'll, we'll post those, you know, definitely post those with the hashtag ID24, your, your slides so that they get shared out. And mm -hmm. Thanks to everybody for their participation, both presenters and the host within um, TPG and all the folks doing captioning. It's been a great 24 hours. Uh, congrats to everyone. You did a really great job. That was great. It was great wrapping up with you, Denis. Honored to have done that. Thanks, guys. Merci.